Hey everybody, welcome to the second Sunday of Pentecost. This week we see some hope, I think, of life returning to whatever normal used to be. Um, and I personally am pretty hopeful for our economy and our society being able to open up, and especially for our churches being able to try and get back together. Uh, I miss worshiping together. I miss singing, especially. But I hope that this um, set of readings and this homily finds you well today, and that on this beautiful Lord's Day, you are able to set aside some time for worship and contemplation and prayer. This week's readings begin that long season of God's long summer in the lectionary. We begin in Genesis this week, chapter 18, for a long reading. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under that tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind them. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the said time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, Oh, yes, you did. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham and Sarah, have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Our epistle reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for perhaps a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, 
It begins at the end of chapter 9 and goes through chapter 10. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send, you, to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out where, find out who in it is worthy, and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or that town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey everybody. This week's readings uh, have a lot of language in them about being sent out into the world. We hear uh, from the Matthew passage, especially Jesus' first instructions to his inner group of disciples as they go out into the world to spread the gospel and to heal and cast out demons. And as I read and thought about these passages this week, I um, was struck by two encounters that I had uh, at school. Uh, with two uh, grown women. Uh, they, they have grandchildren and have been um, uh, faithful workers at the school for much longer than I've been there. And within the span of, I don't know, 24 hours, these two encounters happened that really struck me um, as, as being important and um, really on point for this week. Uh, the first one was with a dear sweet woman uh, who works in our office who uh, has had many conversations with me over the years uh, about her Catholic background and about how her faith impacts her life and her work 
And she and I have had lots of really great conversations about her perspective on the things that go on at the school and that go on in our society. In passing, uh, she overheard a uh, joking conversation that I had with someone else where I was quoting scripture uh, to um, uh, passive aggressively shut somebody down on something that they were trying to do. And uh, she came by and joined in the joke and said, well, where did you hear that? I said, oh, I, I read that in the Bible. She said, oh, I'm Catholic. We, we don't get to read the Bible. And that cut me to the bone because she's right. Uh, in many of uh, our Catholic communities around us, and especially in historic Catholicism, reading the Bible was something reserved just for the priests. Now, thankfully, this sweet woman can joke about that fact uh, and take it lightly. Uh, but that stuck with me for the rest of the day and really for the rest of the week. Uh, just what the big difference is between my life of faith and her life of faith. The second one came when a group of us were trapped in the records room trying to sort out last year's records and bring in the new year's records, which is always a painstaking and brainless day's worth of activity while we're moving file folders from these giant fireproof cabinets uh, into, into boxes to be destroyed. And as I was um, reading through my pile of folders and making sure that I had all the right ones, I heard another uh, friend, another office worker, comment on what a strange name this child had. Now, we encounter a lot of unusual names, but this one name in particular stood out to her and she couldn't even pronounce it. M Malachi? Ma Malachi? It was Malachi. And this sweet woman, who has, by her own admission, been in church her entire life, didn't recognize the name Malachi. That one hit me too. We didn't really make much of a big deal out of it. We were also uh, brainless by that time. But later I was reflecting on that, on the importance and the difference of how we are equipped to go out into the world to actually share the gospel. And I thought a lot about our Baptist heritage, about the work that our Baptist ancestors have done in this country and around the world, the hospitals that have been built, the orphanages that have been built, the civil service organizations, the pension funds, all the things that we've done uh, just to keep the gospel going, never mind the massive and intricate and powerful missionary organizations that have been the backbone of the mission of our Baptist neighbors since we started calling ourselves Baptists. And these two little anecdotes, which you probably have shared uh, in your own lives at some point, they've stuck with me as I've meditated on this week's readings, especially our gospel passage, about being sent out, about not taking anything with you, and about just what the gospel is. Don't forget, friends, what the gospel really is. The gospel is not the healings. It's not the miracles. It's not the casting out of demons. The gospel, as Jesus tells his disciples, is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, has come near. It is short, it is simple, and it is profound. The kingdom of heaven has come near. We would do well to meditate on that idea. We're so good at adding layer upon layer uh, uh, to the gospel. We have to lay all these intricate facts about Jesus' 
death and resurrection and ascension and second coming. When, according to Jesus, the gospel is about the kingdom of heaven coming near to us and to our neighbors and to our world, the gospel is not about a miracle. It's about the presence of God with us and our presence with God. As he sends the disciples out, he equips them with just that. Then he gives them this authority over demons and unclean spirits. He gives them the power to heal the sick. And he gives them instructions of where to go and, well, to eat a lot, apparently. We, too, are sent into the world equipped with that one basic truth. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is both a promise of a future culmination of when God comes and claims this world as his own. And it is also a testimony that defies the world around us. Saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand seems like a lie today. It seems like with our world and our society on fire in so many different ways, where we're on quarantine and we're locked down, and at the same time there's protests and riots and people fighting for their own identities. For us to go out into the world and say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, seems like we're mocking the suffering of real people in the world. And yet that's what we're called to do. We're called to go out and say, kingdom of heaven has come near. It has come near in the person and work of Jesus Christ. All we're sent out into the world, this world full of wolves and we but sheep, all we're sent out with is that truth. In those little encounters I had with the ladies in my office, I thought about just what that truth looks like when we carry it with us out the door. I think I've lost a lot of ground in my ability to witness to the kingdom of God by relying on this baseline knowledge of the Bible. I've learned not everybody knows the Bible like I do or like you do. Not everybody can identify those 66 books because they were in Bible drill. Not everybody gets the vacation Bible school jokes about Oreo cookies and red Kool-Aid. What I have to learn is that my neighbors, those people to whom I am sent and among whom I live every day, those neighbors don't necessarily have a baseline understanding of the scriptures or of church or of God. So when I go into the world as a sheep amongst the wolves, when I go into these villages, I need to take the advice of Jesus Christ when he's telling his disciples that they don't need to worry about what they're going to say because the words will come from God. You know what I'll say? I'll probably open up some treatise on New Testament interpretation or the contextualization of Romans. No, that's not what's needed today. What we need to do, what I need to do as I go into the world is to carry with me just the gospel that the kingdom of God is at hand and that I need to have the faith and the courage to let God speak through me. Not me trying to speak on behalf of God. Not me trying to unpack this very complex gospel that it seems I've created over the years, but rather to be calm and be still in my soul and let God speak through me that simple and profound gospel. I 
think today that's the best we can do. The best we can do is to keep this thing simple and to shine the light of hope that Paul speaks of into this world that increasingly does not know and needs to know that the kingdom of heaven has come near them. Amen. And now, may God bless you and keep you. May God cause his countenance to rise upon you. May God cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.